Um, joining us now, New York Congressman and Ranking Member of the House Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler. Congressman, thank you for joining us. I know you were inside that room listening to the Prime Minister's speech. What did you think of it? I thought it was fundamentally dishonest. Um, he says he wants a peace, but his, uh, um, his political interest is to keep the war going as long as possible because he knows that as soon as the war is over, he'll have to face a commission of inquiry as to why he was uh, telling Qatar to arm Hamas uh, before the election and why he uh, um, 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 ignored uh, warnings uh, from the military about the attack uh, on October 7th, which they had a uh, warnings about uh, a few hours earlier, and uh, why, for that matter, it took uh, 12 hours for tanks to come 60 miles from the West Bank to, uh, to the Kibbutzim on the Gaza border. And he knows he'll have to answer these questions. Um, and his interest is to keep the war going as long as possible. And uh, uh, that's what he's doing. And when he talks about the hostages, I don't believe he has any interest in releasing the hostages uh, because... Um, um, that would hasten the end of the war. And that's why you see uh, hostage negotiations, and he keeps putting new conditions. He keeps putting new objections to the hostage uh, uh, deal. And that's why you see uh, hundreds of thousands of people in, in Israel protesting, uh, protesting against, against him. You've called him the worst leader in Jewish history since the Maccabean king who invited the Romans into Jerusalem over 2,100 years ago, 2,100 yeah. years ago. Um, yes, I did. You just talked about this speech right now and his own self-interest, and you argue his lack of interest in getting any of the hostages home. Do you think that there can be a negotiated peace with Benjamin Netanyahu still as prime minister? Probably not. Uh, he will do anything he can to, uh, to, to stop a negotiated peace. Um, and he was fundamentally dishonest today also when he came out, you know, about the, the terribleness of, uh, of uh, assassination. Back in 1994, he was leading uh, uh, people saying, kill, kill Rabin, kill Rabin, just before Rabin was assassinated. I want to ask you about the Democratic Party. Um, we saw the divide. We literally saw it in that room. We saw some Democrats standing and applauding. We saw others sitting and maybe lightly applauding or not applauding at all. We saw Rashida Tlaib holding up a sign that said war criminal. And we saw a lot of empty seats because a number of Democrats uh, chose not to go to this speech. What is it like within the Democratic Party right now on the issue of Israel? Well, there's divided, uh, obviously, there's divided uh, sentiment. Uh, I would have uh, not gone except I, I, I thought I should go uh, in honor of the state of Israel, but certainly not in support of, of its prime minister or his policies. Uh, but obviously, sentiment in, in the Democratic Party is quite divided. And uh, Rashida uh, was expressing the sentiments of her uh, uh, Palestinian constituents in Dearborn. How does the Democratic Party um, campaign with this issue? How, does, how do you suggest VP Kamala Harris tackles it? She's going to have to as she goes forward. Well, I think she's going to express general support for Israel. Uh, she's going to be somewhat less supportive than President Biden has been. And I think that a uh, large part of the Democratic Party, uh, especially the younger elements of the party, the younger members of the party want that. Um, and that's what I think will, ha will happen. The, um, the relationship between Israel and the United States feels like it's at a crossroads. Uh, as we were talking about a moment ago, it's always been a bipartisan relationship, or it had historically been a bipartisan relationship. And now it feels like Benjamin Netanyahu is, um, uh, you know, more firmly aligning himself with Republicans. Can it go back to being a bipartisan relationship? Well, Netanyahu's aligning himself with Republicans is not new. Remember back in 2015, he came here uh, to uh, oppose a President uh, Obama's policy of the nuclear deal with Iran, um, and, and he was quite consciously uh, taking the Republican position uh, against uh, the Obama administration. Uh, the, the stupidity of this manifested itself in the fact that, well, when Trump got into office, uh, he persuaded Trump to withdraw from the nuclear deal, which was ridiculous. And now we know that uh, Iran has enriched a lot of uranium and is, in a cusp, is on the cusp of becoming a nuclear uh, uh, power, 
where that deal was was and would continue would have continued to stop them. But uh, uh, his uh, I don't I, I do not understand why he was opposed to the deal. Um, but do you think but the it was party very can, historically speaking, before 2015, before he started to align himself with Republicans? It, the, the relationship between Israel and the U.S. was bipartisan. Aaron David Miller was just explaining that's what made it so strong. That's what tied these two countries together. Can it go back to being bipartisan? I hope it can, but I don't know whether it can or not. Hmm. Um, just because I have you and I'm about to change topics to talk about the vice president and her campaign, who would you like to see on the ticket? Oh, there are any number of good people you can make a case for. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Kelly as a, as, a, as a former astronaut, uh, the husband of a victim of gun violence, an anti-gun activist, uh, and an astronaut, and a U.S. senator from a swing state of Arizona, Josh Shapiro, a very popular governor from the very swingy state of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Andy Bashir, who's shown he can get himself elected in, in Appalachian territory, uh, Roy Cooper from the swing state of North Carolina. You can make a case for any of them. And uh, frankly, I'm glad I don't have to make that decision <laughs> like Kamala Harris does. Congressman Jerry Nadler, nothing but tough questions for you today, sir. Thank you for joining us.